Hello, sisters. Lesbian Psychology's Explorations and Challenges, edited by the Boston Lesbian Psychologies Collective, Part 5, Community, Essay 20, the last essay. Beyond Community, Politics and Spirituality, by Francine Lee Raynone. My grandparents were immigrants from Italy, brave and proud. I spent most of my early life convinced by the dominant culture that Italian Americans were either ruthless gangsters or ignorant, quote unquote, grease balls. As soon as I could, I ran as far and as fast as I could from the community into which I was born. Some of the motivation to run from internalized hatred of Italian. Some was a survival response to the crushing sexism and homophobia of the Italian American community. But part of the motivation came, came from inside knowledge of the, of the potentially and often actually crippling effects of a strong community has on dissenters, progressives, and visionaries. Although I later reclaimed much of value in my Italian heritage, throughout my years of participation in the anti-militaristic, feminist, and anti-nuclear movements, I have retained my childhood skepticism toward the glories of community living. I want to pass this skepticism on to others. Once we get clear about what communities are, I think we'll see the developing lesbian communities would undermine the strength of our feminist politics. If, as lesbians, we hope to renew our commitment to social change and replenish our energies for the long struggle that lies before us, it isn't communities we need, but rather the concise addition of a spiritual dimension to our politics. People use the term lesbian community without a clear sense of what they are talking about. It is one, one of the many unexamined and misunderstood concepts in our common vocabulary. And all unexamined concepts that are misunderstood lead to confusion, misdirected energies, and pain. To understand this concept, it would be helpful to use ethnic and racial communities as our model rather than spiritual or utopian ones, because the vast majority of lesbians are in no position to choose their renunciation from the world entailed by joining spiritual and utopian communities. If ethnic and racial communities are our models, we can define a community as a group of people living in the same geographical area, sharing customs, beliefs, values, and language, who are bound to one another by traditions, norms, and institutions of mutual support and reciprocal obligation. Given this definition, the common use of the term lesbian community is often completely inappropriate. To the extent that lesbians live in different neighborhoods, speak different languages, have different customs, beliefs, and values, and most important, to the extent that they are not bound to one another by norms and institutions of mutual support and reciprocal obligation, they do not form communities. What we call the Boston-Cambridge lesbian community, for example, is really a set of intersecting friendship networks and lesbian enclaves, where enclave is defined as a minority cultural group within a larger group. <clears throat> Often, neighbors, even if they share the same language and customs, live quite independently of one another. It is ongoing, day-to-day -day positive interactions that transform neighborhoods into communities. This interaction is structured by traditions, norms, and institutions of mutual support and reciprocal obligation. Traditions and norms include the sharing of news, gossip, meals, and childcare, gifts and loans of money, sharing housing with people temporarily displaced or financially burdened, giving and receiving emotional, financial, and practical help around significant events such as childbirth, sickness, marriage, divorce, and death. Community institutions may include schools, banks, healthcare services, retailers, religious organizations, and social clubs. These institutions are community-based to the extent that they are owned or controlled by community members and rely on the community's patronage and goodwill for their survival. There are good material reasons why lesbians have not developed these conditions for creating communities. 
We have neither the numbers, the geographical proximity, nor the money to support many institutions. Women's bookstores, for example, may be owned and staffed by lesbians and may stock a tantalizing section selection of lesbian writings, but they could not survive without selling the non-lesbian and selling to non-lesbians and selling materials by non-lesbians. There are a few bars, publications, and presses exclusively or almost exclusively for lesbians, but as institutions, they are the exception rather than the rule. Even when lesbians in big cities choose to live in the same area, they do not have the capital to set up neighborhood stores, social clubs, health centers, and so forth. For the most part, lesbians are dependent on institutions serving the wider women's and gay quote-unquote communities, and even straight society. <clears throat> even if we overcame these material obstacles, we would still face structural ones. A significant difference between ethnic or racial communities and lesbian groups is that the traditions and norms we develop come almost exclusively from friendship networks. Friendships, whether or not they are based on sexual intimacy, are often unstable bonds. I do not by any means think that this is more true for lesbians than for anyone else. But, heterosexuals have a structural advantage in developing community norms and traditions. The existence of formally recognized blood and kinship ties. Blood ties are are indissoluble. You can't divorce your family members, even if you hate their guts. Kinship ties can be socially reinforced. As a result, in ethnic communities... One learns early that loyalty and obligation do not have to rest on friendship or approval. As a child, I was expected to respect my family members across class lines regardless of their individual characteristics. We considered ourselves entitled to financial and emotional support without question, even when our behavior was questionable. Personal feuds were not allowed to continue for very long. I remember the time my father hadn't spoken to his uncle for several months. My mother and aunt simply announced that we were all having dinner on Palm Sunday, and they would shake hands in front of all of us before dinner. We expected, and were expected, to be in close contact our entire lives. This perspective made it imperative to try to see each other's point of view and learn to get along with one another. Where our differences were irreconcilable, they were often set aside, as in the case of my father and uncle, for the sake of the family. In part, this was because not meeting a family obligation would usually entail community retribution. This situation contrasts sharply with most lesbian associations, which are based almost entirely on positive personal feelings an insufficient foundation for long-term stability. Two kinds of lesbian groups that tend to avoid this difficulty are self-help organizations based on specific conditions or oppressions and organizations based on common work. Once again, these conditions are usually based on larger ones. In the former category, for example, Overeaters Anonymous, OA, or Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, have lesbian chapters in the Boston-Cambridge area. Both of them provide ongoing support and create reciprocal obligations among their members. They foster tolerance of members' idiosyncrasies and differences for the sake of enabling them to free themselves from addiction. People who do the same work, like members of a family, often believe they will be in close contact for the rest of their lives. Unions and professional associations often engender reciprocal obligations among their members. During my academic career, I was a member of the Midwest branch of the Society for Women in Philosophy, SWIP. It is a model of the values and virtue of sisterhood. In SWIP, more established members write hiring, promotion, and tenure support letters for less established members. During these meetings, no one has to shout to be heard, but we care about each other enough not to be polite or timid when we disagree. Even when we disagree, we come to one another's defense when the seriousness and value of our work is questioned by male philosophers. 
Personal feuds are expected to be settled and are main t- and are mediated by other members when they are not. For feminists and lesbian feminists, harassed by the arrogance, ignorance, and in- intractability of patriarchal academia, SWIP provides an intellectually an intellectual community that is essential to its members' survival and integrity. But although organizations based on specific conditions and those based on common work foster strong bonds, the kinds of support they offer members are necessarily limited by their functions. For example, it is not SWIFT's business to help its members face the end of significant relationships, although friends within the organization often do this for each other. So these types of organizations are vital to lesbian survival in a homophobic world, but in the end, but in and of themselves, they do not constitute the basis for full-fledged communities. There are a few historical examples of friendship networks arising from these and other kinds of organizations that are strong and flexible enough to create full-fledged communities among their members. But because lesbians lack numbers, money, kinship structures, and sufficient separate ongoing institutions to serve them, these communities rarely survive more than one generation, if even that long. The conditions that prevent lesbians from establishing communities are historically contingent, and it is possible that they could be overcome. But I believe the goal of creating lesbian communities is not politically desirable. It rests on a micro-conception of the nature of politics, as well as a micro-conception of who we are. Politics is essentially about power, the power people have to control the conditions under which they live. Communities bring their members three important political benefits. I believe lesbians can obtain the first two benefits by other means, and that the third, far from being a benefit to us, would undermine our movement. The first benefit of a community is that to the extent that institutions are truly community-based, they are necessarily responsive to the needs of those they serve. The providers of services essential to one's well-being are responsive to one's criticism and requests certainly gives a person more control over the conditions under which she lives. But, as we have seen, lesbians do not have the resources to create all of our own institutions. What we can do is continue to struggle for quality services from the institutions we need, whether they be healthcare centers or hardware stores. A second benefit of a community is that the more we are visible, publicly identifiable groups, the more our claim to be recognized and protected legally is legitimized. Without visibility, there can be no legitimacy to political struggle on behalf of particular groups. But notice the limited nature of, of this benefit. It is related primarily to civil rights protections for lesbians as a group. This is unquestionably important, but as feminists, we want a lot more than legal rights. We want the end of patriarchy. Furthermore, we can achieve visibility without the ghettoization intrinsic to establishing communities by continuing our work as lobbyists, special interest organizations, and caucuses within organizations. Our quest for visibility is also better served by the courage of individuals and groups of lesbians who openly identify themselves as lesbians and challenge homophobia where they live and work. The third benefit that a community may provide its members is a strong sense of self-identity. Common wisdom from at least Marx onward has it that a group cannot organize on its own behalf without a conscious sense of self-identity. Lesbians do need a sense of self-identity, but not just the kind fostered by communities. Communities are based on the similarities among their members. In communities of oppressed people, it becomes even more important that members be similar. It seems to make clear the boundaries between those who are with us and those who are against us. And the more society tells us that what we are is perverted and despicable, the more important it will seem that when we are among quote-unquote our own kind, we should not be criticized. In communities of oppressed people, difference is often perceived as betrayal, especially when it involves contact with, with or similarity to the oppressors. Paradoxically, the demand for uncritical acceptance leads to more rather than less interpersonal criticism. It leads to lesbians policing one another's behavior. (laughs) 
Community policing is familiar to me from my childhood. When I was growing up, I was told if I valued my Italian heritage, I would not want to live outside my parents' home until I was married. The suggestion that Christopher Columbus was not the first European to come to this continent was considered proof of mental instability. As a university professor, I was told by local feminists that if I valued working class women, I would not have such a bourgeois, quote unquote, apolitical job. Once I had my hair permed, you can imagine what I was told then. Fortunately for me, I never wanted to wear skirts or dresses. I am not suggesting that lesbians stop living in enclaves and making autonomous, lesbian-only spaces. We need spaces in which we are the norm in order to reconstruct our identity in a positive sense. But the fact that a space contains only lesbians does not guarantee that it fosters everyone's positive sense of self-identity. There are lesbian bars in which I feel neither safe nor comfortable, because the lesbians in them have customs, beliefs, and values that are different and perhaps even antithetical to mine. The fact is that more often than not, lesbians have very little in common. We may eat and drink different things, dance differently, listen to different music, make love differently from one another. We certainly do not all have the same history. Insofar as we are of different ages, abilities, sizes, classes, and races, our oppression as women, as lesbians, takes very different forms. The strength of our movement lies in our diversity and in the fact that we are forced to recognize diversity. The power of feminism, its advantages over prior ideologies of liberation, is that it insists on the connection between types of oppression. Particularly as lesbian feminists, we must necessarily recognize the connectedness of our diversity in order to work together at all. We don't have the numbers to act any other way. We have learned that we cannot assert that sexism or racism or any single oppression is always the issue. We increasingly recognize that if we don't work in coalitions across divisions of ethnicity, race, and class, we will not have power, the power to change society. But this realization has brought us to an impasse. We have become so painfully aware of our, our diversity that we have fallen back on the bankrupt liberal view that we have to support whatever lesbians do because we're all oppressed together. I never believed that was true for Italians, and I don't believe it's true for lesbians. Our problem is how we recognize our diversity and still feel enough connected to one another to work together over the long haul. Some have suggested that we don't need to feel connected, that if we recognize that our survival depends on each other, we will work in coalitions because we must. But that can't be the whole story. Fear for our survival can motivate us to begin working together, but cannot sustain our working together. We cannot be united merely externally by a common hatred and resistance of those who oppress us. A politics based on common hatred fostered, fosters limited and shallow bonds. It creates a commonality that can be co-opted because it does not create for each of us a felt personal ta stake in the liberation of others. The way out of this impasse is not to build communities, not to develop the ability to create and recreate a communal sense, a connectedness among us, that allows for diversity and inspires us to continue to work together. To sustain our work in coalitions, to transform that work from divisive distrust and mutual recrimination to cooperation and mutual respect, we need skills that enable us to make personal connections with other lesbians and allies who are radically different from us. I suggest that the best method for methods for creating connections with each other come from feminist spirituality. Even today, spiritual lesbian feminists are caricatured as reactionaries who smile a lot, sing a lot, seek only long-term monogamous relationships, and never lust. That hasn't been my experience. Like everything else, lesbian and feminist, spiritual lesbian feminists are marked by diversity and by disagreements. Rather than emphasizing these, I want to discuss in general, sorry, in a general way, the effects on political struggle that result from following almost any spiritual practice. 
Specifically, I am convinced that most spiritual disciplines make lesbians more capable of, and more likely to, continue in political struggle throughout our whole lives. The two main barriers in long-term political engagement seem to be burnout and the development of a divisive anger aimed at each other as our oppressors. Spiritual practices help prevent burnout in several ways. Many techniques are interdirected, and as such, they provide a needed balance to a life of out-directed activities. And many techniques provide us access to the strength and support of others, so that we do not feel alone or overwhelmed by the forces against us. Almost all forms of self almost all are forms of self-renewal. Although the mechanism differs with practice, they have the effect of affirming and strengthening self-identity. Anger is born of pain, the pain of sadness or of fear or both. Our experiences of both pain and anger are transformed by spiritual practice. Like so- psychotherapy at its best, a spiritual practice at its best makes us more consciously aware of our feelings, moods, and emotions, and gives us the perspective that allows us to make choices about whether and how to express them. One of the major aims of most spiritual practices is the development of a sense of compassion for oneself as well as for others. In this context, both personal and others' pain is seen as motivation to work rather than... sorry. To work rather than in a, an incapacitated fact of existence. In many forms of mediation, one has to. Sorry, in many forms of meditation, one has the experience of being in pain and simultaneously being relaxed, centered, and clear. The same thing happens with feelings of fear, terror, and despair. After repeated experiences of this kind of. of this kind. Meditators often feel a deeper sense of personal power and courage. By confronting the things that debilitate them, they are able to begin to overcome them. Serious practice of certain forms of meditation enable people to work through unconscious material and make greater peace with themselves and others. Given that many lesbian feminist political groups are torn apart by conflicts that often originate as as much from unconscious patterns of family disharmony as from genuine political disagreement, any technique that renders these patterns visible is politically important. When such techniques are free or inexpensively acquired and can be practiced anywhere, their appeal is even greater. Another politically valuable aspect of much, but not all, lesbian spiritual practice, is an insistence on coming to terms with our own bodies. We are creatures of flesh. Our bodies can be the source of tremendous creativity and power, but they also bear the literal and symbolic scars of patriarchy, and we cannot feel connected to one another before we feel connected to ourselves. Each of us mirrors the alienated hierarchy of patriarchy when we try to dominate our bodies. We devalue them. As women, as lesbians, We have good reasons to distrust our misused bodies and the signals they give us, but we will not know how to trust each other until we reclaim trust in ourselves. Our attitudes towards treatment, no sorry, our attitudes toward and treatment of our bodies often reproduce the dynamics of patriarchal oppression and exploitation. Making these dynamics conscious can be a healing, politically liberating process. Reclaiming our physical selves requires that we learn how to de-objectify our bodies, how to live them in an integrated way. I am not referring to getting in shape or learning self-defense or exploring sexuality. These can be important activities and may be a part of the process. I'm talking about, but they need not be. Regardless of size, shape, and physical condition or abilities, It is important for us to accept our existence as female animals, and even to delight in it. When we value ourselves at such a primary level, our commitment to change the world deepens. Lesbian feminist politics asserts 
that we can control the conditions of our lives in non-oppressive ways that do not require domination. But most political lesbians collapse the notion of domination and power. This confusion is pervasive, but most clearly evident in the discussion of lesbian sexuality. Feminist spirituality distinguishes between power over, or domination, and power from within. Without power from within, without the power that comes from an integrated self, we will not have the skills to control the conditions of our lives in non-oppressive ways. Therefore, without this power, our political goals are unattainable. Overcoming body, bodily alienation is one aspect of developing this kind of power. As Starhawk says, power from within, quote, is not something that we have, but something we can do, end quote. We begin to heal ourselves and each other. We can recognize our connections and build our world that expresses them. The two primary practices by which spiritual feminists renew their power and their connections with each other are meditation and ritual. Far from being esoteric, most of us engage in these practices in some form. Meditation includes any centering technique. Some people meditate or center themselves by gardening, others by doing the dishes or housework, others by chanting, others by feeling the inhalation and exhalation of their breath. To be centered is to feel a calmness and clarity at the core of your being. It is to feel that actions can come from this core, and when they do, they come from a place of power. It is to feel connected to your own power as a fact of life, as much as, if not more, than the existence of the objects around you. When people meditate together, magic can happen. Whether or not there is magic, there are two immediate benefits. Meditation quiets and settles each person's mind, and it creates connections among them. The quote-unquote place of calm and power we each go to when we meditate is the same place. When we meditate, meditate together, we draw on and increase each other's power, creating a shared sense of integrity. In one sense, the boundaries between us dissolve. In another sense, knowing that it is our, only by our own personal actions and dedication that we go to this place of togetherness, our individuality is affirmed. Each person feels centered and knows and feels that all the others in the group are centered. Thus, we meet as equals. For 2,500 years, Buddhists have used one particular form of meditation to heal anger and negativity in their relationships with others. Practiced in a group, meditation is the most powerful tool I know I know of to enable people to disagree, and I still feel supportive of and connected to each other. The possibilities for its use in political groups are exciting and comforting. Rituals, as I am using the term here, is any pattern sequence of actions carried out in order to accomplish a purpose. Ritual calls forth power from within. It is a familiar and integral part of every culture. Most people have rituals for everything from getting up in the morning, lie still for five minutes after the alarm, drink coffee, then shower, to burying the dead. The political importance of ritual lies in its ability to connect people. Rituals affirm the importance and the value of activities engaged in, as well as of the participants. Their usefulness is enhanced by their versatility. They can be tailored to specific situations. Engaging in meditation and ritual does not require subscribing to any particular belief or set of beliefs. These practices renew and deepen our individual powers and create bonds among us. Their use in the U.S., anti-nuclear movement, among others, suggests that they are important to the political health of both individuals and groups. My personal belief is that rituals are politically more, most important for large group actions while meditation is politically important for individuals and small groups. If every mass action included ritual and every political meeting and planning session included a time for meditation, our effectiveness would increase dramatically. Meditation and engaging in rituals together creates a communal sense 
even though people who do not even among people who do not know each other. Through these techniques, we learn about, define, and redefine our limits. The more skillful we become at these practices, the more they will help us to know when we can and cannot work together. Talking to one another, even when we listen, is not enough to connect us. It leaves out too many aspects of the self. We lesbians are too diverse to work together always. Too much divides us. We have hard questions to ask each other about our differences. When we ask them out of fear, defensiveness, or vulnerability. When we do not ask questions but hurl charges of political incorrectness at each other, we help no one. We could use mediation and ritual to create environments in which it is safe to have dialogues about what divides us. Then, even when we disagree irreconcilably, we might prevent the enervating bitterness of our political feuds. For we have only this life, this world, and one another, and not much time.